I'm Marcus, welcome back to another video of JPlay. You might see already I will do something about Brigitte today. But unlike all, or most of my other videos, I will not do a playthrough video of Brigitte because there's already a great playthrough out there by, by Mivi, aka Michael at Board Game Geek, and he did, he did such a terrific job so that I said I don't think it definitely makes sense to have another one out there. So, I will do a rules only video at this point in time. Normally I do the other way around, so when I do playthrough videos I say I will not go into much details about explaining the rules in advance, I will explain this as I play. This will be different. I will base my um, yeah, rule explanation video on a very cool and very helpful translation out there, also on Board Game Geek, a guy named Math um, Matthew. I hope I pronounced that correctly. If not, let me know. Um, so, many thanks for your translation um, from German into English. Right now, as far as I know, there is only a German version out there from Brugge and also for the rules. So, I think especially this uh, was a nice job done by Matthew. Um, thanks very much. Um, yeah, I think we can have a look inside that and yeah, I show you how the game actually works. Maybe I will do one turn just to more or less give you some better overview about all these single actions go together. But if you really want to see how Brugge plays out, so in action, then I would really recommend checking out the video by Michael. And now, let's start! First you have to place the game board in the center of the table so that everyone can reach it and then you can directly place the statue tiles on the corresponding spot over here with the highest value number 7 on top of that and the lowest value uh, with the number 2 at the bottom of the deck. If any player manages to get more than 49 points there are these special 50 and 100 tiles um, that can be put on this place here at, at the bottom of the game board as well. Next you divide up the cards into five heaps, more or less the same of the same size. So one, two, three, four and five. And now depending on the amount of players you would take one pile for each player. So let's say for a two player game you would just take two of those piles here. This will be our main deck whereas the other three piles will be put aside, might be used at a later stage of the game. Next, this main pile will be divided into two new heaps, round about the same size, and this will be our two redraw drags for the rest of the game. Each player takes one of a marker of the corresponding color and puts one of that on the victory point track on this field number five, so each player starts with five victory points. The other marker will be placed here at the town hall, but keep in mind they do not start at one of these values over here. They start basically on level zero. Next, each player takes one large seal token and a small seal token, places the small seal token on a porticus field that's close to him, always between uh, two of these channels, canals here. Then he takes three of these majority tiles with a gray side face up. This represents then later on some special victory conditions that the player can achieve. Each player starts with five florins and additionally everyone gets five workers of five different colors. That's brown, purple, blue, red and yellow. That concludes the setup already for each player, so no one draws any cards during the starting phase of the game, so this will be done in the very first turn. This red seal, or this big seal over here, just represents the player color, so that everyone knows what player or what color each player is using. The player who has most recently fried something will be the starting player and get this seal for Brugge for the first round. In the first phase every player gets to draw cards up to five so this current hand limit is normally five. Um, he can decide whether to go for this or that pile but whenever one pile of those two is uh, depleted for example let's just simulate that for a second so for example the 
First player takes four cards from this pile. So this is now depleted. What then happens is the cards that have been left aside, the big pile for the remaining of this game, will be in placed beside on that on the empty spot here, and then the player could go forward and draw a card from this pile. But this also means that this will be the last round in this game. So everyone has now the possibility to do one action or one yeah what will complete complete round, and then the game ends with a final scoring. Note that these cards have different colored backsides. So this is a yellow card and this is a red card. So this means on the other side, so on the top side or the front side of the card, there would also be a yellow character. So this might be really important when selecting which pile to draw from. And that's also the reason why it's not allowed to check the cards prior to having your hand full of five cards. So you can draw a card from here, but you cannot look at that. Then you can, you can decide, do I need a, yellow, a purple card or a red card? So in this case, maybe he needs a purple card. Then we go here for a red card, then for a brown card, and then again, maybe for a yellow card. Now the first player has drawn his five cards, then the next player will do the same and so on. And this more or less already concludes phase one of this game. Phase two consists of two steps. Doing first the first step, the starting player will load all the five colored dice and will put them in order on the appropriate spots here on the main board, so in the ascending order here. And then for each five or six that is rolled, the appropriate color of the threat token will be given to each of the players. In this case, only the yellow die shows a five, so uprising token will be given to each of the player. If a player would acquire the third token of a specific color, in this case the yellow one, that special hardship would occur. In this case, the player would lose all of his gold. That's the reason why you should try to keep keep an eye on the amount of threat tokens you currently have. In a later stage of the game, there's always a possibility to get rid of those threat tokens. In step two of phase two, now each player could advance. And he can do though by paying the amount of florins that has been rolled as the numbers ones and two. So all the ones and twos are being summarized and this is the cost to advance. So in this case, each player that would want to advance in this round would need to pay five florins to advance one step. So there might be rounds where advancing might be more expensive and sometimes less expensive. In case no ones or twos have been rolled, no player would be allowed to advance. Also, also each player can only advance one level during one round. So even if he would have enough money, he would not allow it to advance more than one step. Now phase three starts and I think this should be the most important part of this game. And this is now to play cards and take the appropriate actions. The action that you are allowed to take is also depicted on each of these cards here. And this would mean take two workers, take Florence, remove a threat token, build a kennel, build a house, and use this special ability of the person that's depicted on this card over here. But keep in mind, you can only place this person here in your personal display when you have a free house in your display as well. Remember, the house is built by this action. Now let's have a closer look at the single actions. The first action here says, take two workers, and I think the icons are pretty clear. In this case it says you are allowed to draw two workers and because it's a yellow card you would need to draw two yellow workers. This will be put in your personal display which is open so anyone can see that and then the card will be discarded. The next action says take one to six florins and this is now depending on, this, on the number that's printed on the die that has the same color. In this case, the yellow die would decide. So we have a look at the yellow die. So in this case, we would be allowed to take five florins. The next possible action would be to remove threat. And again, the color of the card decides with threat to put away 
or to discard from your personal display. In this case, this uprising card would be removed from your plane. And additionally, for each threat that's removed from your personal display, you gain one victory point. The next action lets you build a canal. In order to build a canal, you have to put that adjacent to your yeah, home position over here. So for example, in this very first turn, you could go for the blue canal here or the yellow canal over here. And in this case, we played a yellow card. So we have to build the yellow canal over here. Here, the price is listed that this piece of the canal would cost. So in this case, one florin. So the player would place one florin over there and then he would be allowed to plate a canal. In the next turn then he could go for either this canal or for this canal. Whenever a player manages to build a canal on this third piece over here and there's also a third piece on the other side then he would gain three additional victory points by the end of the game. And that's important because you could lose a canal through a threat token and the bad things that derive from that. If a player even manages to fill all the five canals on one of those sides, of course he could go for both canals, then he would be allowed to draw the top statue token over here and put this on this personal display. By the end of the game this gives him the amount of victory points that's printed on the tile and keep in mind these decrease in value. So that's absolutely a good idea. If you want to go for canal building, you should do that as early as possible to maximize the amount of victory points that you get from that. The fifth option would be to build a house. Players can build a house by spending one worker. The worker must match the color of the card you have played and then he would be allowed to place a card from his hand face down in front of him and this now is a house for him. Remember, he's not allowed now to play the person that's printed on the other side, so this card is more or less then locked and only serves as a house. Good thing about houses, for once, is it give, each house gives you one victory point by the end of the game, and it's also important for the sixth action that you are allowed to take, and this would be to place a person. You place a person on an empty spot on your house, on an empty house, so each house can only host one person, then you would need to pay the amount of florins that printed, printed on the top left corner of the card, so in this case that's three florins, and from then you would be allowed to use this person. Let's have a closer look at the person cards. I already showed you the right side, which shows you again the option that you are allowed to take, but there's also a left side to this card. One value I already explained to you, this would be the price of the card. Below the price of the card, there's a victory point. So for each person you're playing, you're normally getting some victory points by the end of the game. That's normally one third of the cost to place that um, person. Then there's the name of the person. In this case, it's a marble trader. And then there is a special condition or some special ability that each person would bring you. As well, there is a symbol to which kind of um, business each one belongs. So there's one for trade, there's one for religion, one for scoundrels, and so on. And last but not least, there are different symbols. In this case, there is an infinite loop, which says you can use this card more or less any time throughout the game. In this case, each time or the special advantage of the Marvel Trader here would allow you to gain three additional more florins whenever you're using a yellow die with the number four on that for doing a florin action I explained to you so when going for this symbol over here. So in this case the player would not take just four florins but seven florins. And again he can use that more or less any time throughout the game so when he really wants to go for some money he can do that four times in a row in this turn. There are three other symbols in the game. One would be to show this flash symbol over here and this says that as soon as you place this person this special ability will be used but only really a, as a one-time action. In this case the Faulkner here would draw three cards from, the, from one of the stack to his hand. Might be nice but again he can only use that when playing this person. 
The next symbol shows a worker of a color. So this could be more or less any color that's been used in this game. So in this case, in order to activate his special ability, the player would need to spend one worker. So this goes will be discarded. Then this card will be tagged. So these cards can only be used once during a round. That's very important. And then the special ability can be used. The last symbol is this laurel wreath over here and this means that this person gives you some special victory points by the end of the game. During a round normally each player would be allowed to play four cards that means he could take four of those action. And also keep in mind each round normally starts with five cards on his hand. There are some special conditions and some special cards which would allow you to, for example, go for a second action or draw new cards. But the rule says each round starts with five cards and then you would be allowed to play four of them out of these five. Of course, each player would only be allowed to play one action at a time and then the next player would take a turn and so on until each player has done four actions. So let's just do an example over here. So red player plays his first card, this would be a red card, and decides that he needs two additional workers. So he takes two red workers because it's a red card and then the other player's turn would start. So for example, blue player would play a brown card, would do something with that. Then it would be again the red player. This time the red player would decide to play the yellow card because he needs some money. The yellow die in this example shows the value 4. In this case, because this is the marble trader, he would be allowed now to draw 7 florins. I already explained you this example. Now again, the blue player would take a turn and would also play a yellow card, would do something with that. Then, for example, the red player would play another yellow card. This time he would decide to discard a threat token over here. So in this case he would give one threat token back to the reserve. He would gain one victory point and again then it would be the turn of the blue player. This time he would play a blue card, do something with that. And now already the last action in this round would start and the red player would select to play a brown card in this case. And this time he says I want to play uh, build a house, so he flips that down, puts that in top of him. He needs to pay a brown worker because it's a brown house. And then the blue player would also take his last action and this would be for example also a brown card and would do something other with that. After this action phase, phase 4 would start and this would start in ex to examine the three majorities that are possible. The first majority will be to check for any majority in respect to the advance. In this case, really only the player who is my, most advanced on this track over here would be allowed to flip over this advanced majority tile to the colored side. So in this case, this tile would bring the red player four victory points by the end of the game. It's important to mention that, for example, in a later stage of the game, if the green player would, for example, go here and would take the lead in the town hall over here, the red player does not have to flip his side back to the gray side. So once you had, at one time during the game, the majority, you would keep that benefit until the rest of the game. Also, only real majorities count. So it at any time um, in this phase, both players would share the leading position, in this case the red and the green player. No one of those could claim the benefit or could flip the majority marker to the colored side. So you really need to lead. So for example, during next turn, green would decide to advance one more step because he had more than enough money. Then the round afterwards or the round at the end of the next round, he would then be allowed to flip his uh, majority marker to the colored side. The next majority would to check about the amount of person that a player would have placed in front of him. Again, only real majorities do count, so an even or a tie does not help you. So in this case, red has two persons in front of him, whereas blue only one. In this case, the red player would have the majority in respect to persons and this would allow him 
to flip his personal majority tile to the colored side as well, also bringing him five victory points by the end of the game. And as with the advanced majority tile, this will never be flipped back to the gray side. The last majorities is how big your canal is. In this case, red has two canal tiles built already, whereas blue has three. In this case, blue could flip his canal majority tile to the colored side. Just like as the other majority tiles, a tie does not help. You really need a clear majority. When all these majorities have been jacked, the starting player will go to the next player in a clockwise order, in this case in a two-player game. Red would give the starting player marker over to blue and he would start the game in the next turn. I already explained that whenever one of these tab draw piles runs out, this will be replenished by the remainder of the deck and then this would more or less mean that this is the last round. There might be a special condition for, for a special card that I think this Fogner over here, which would allow you to draw three cards in this case. And this is normally done not in phase one, but in phase three, so when playing the card. In this case, the next round will completely be played. So this is some very rare exception that will happen during the game. When each player has taken his last action in this game, then, or the last round in this game, then the final scoring would occur. The first thing to go for the scoring is to just summarize the amount of victory points that you played persons would allow you. In this case, Red has these two people or his two persons in front of him and this one over here brings him one victory points. This brings him two victory points, so for that he gains a total of three victory points for the persons. Then the houses will be counted. And the houses are pretty simple. Each house that's in front of you gives you one victory points. In this case, three additional victory points for red. The next points will be granted by persons that have the laurel wreath symbol over here. In this case, this is some kind of yeah, a writer, I would say, and it says at by the end of the game, take two victory points for each person that has this art symbol on the bottom of the page. Two victory points. And I play it that way that this also counts as well, though in this case he has three persons with the art symbol on the bottom, so he would gain six additional victory points. Mind, there are several other victory conditions out there on different any cards. For example, there are laurel wreath persons that gives you two extra points for canals and stuff like that. So the variety is very big. Next, each player counts the majority markers that are on the colored side. So red was able to flip two of his majority markers to the colored side. So the advance marker and uh, not the, the person marker and the advance marker. And in this case, this would grant him eight additional victory points. Next, the canals will be scored and in this case this was really some very good builder and he managed to complete for once the canal on field number three. So for that he gains three additional victory points and he also completed the whole canal to the right of his starting position over here. So he has also managed to grab himself a statue tile. So for example, this one over here. So this gives him also seven victory points. So for the canal, he would now gain 10 victory points in total, seven for the statue and three for this field over here. Last thing would be to score the points for the advancement tracks. So in this case, green would gain four victory points, red three, yellow two, and blue one. In this case, if a player would um, share position with another player, in this case, both players would get the full amount of the track they're on. Then each player compares the amount of victory points that he or she has, and the player with the most victory points wins the game. Easy as that. Before I end my rule explanation episode about Prügge here, I want to give you a short overview about all the catastrophes that are in this game. So whenever a player would receive the third token of a color, that special hardship would occur. If the player receives the third red fire token over here, this means the fire breaks out and this means for once he can decide now to give back one house that's already in front of him or he can choose to give or destroy a canal tile. There are two special conditions for that. For once, gaps are not allowed in the canal. So in this five canal tile, he cannot just give back 
this one over here, so gaps are not allowed. If he would have already five of these canal tiles over here and would have drawn uh, this statue over here, he does not need to give that back. So whenever he claimed that statue over here, he can keep that. But also, he's not allowed to grab a new statue whenever he would finish that canal again. The next hardship would be the conspiracy and this simply means the player loses three victory points and he cannot go below zero victory points. I think that's the reason why each player starts off with five victory points by the, by the start of the game. This is the uprising and when a player receives his third token over here he would lose all his florins back to the bank. When he gains the third pestilence token then the player would need to discard one person that's already in his personal display and give it just back to the reserve. And if a flood occurs, the player loses all of his workers, also going back to the reserve. This ends my rule explanation of Brigham. Hope some of the rules have become clear to you. If not, really I recommend you to go to Board Game Geek and check out Michael's playthrough of Brigham. So Mivi is the username here. And yeah, I think with that, some of the things might become a little bit clearer. I might be doing a full length playthrough at a later point in time, but as I already mentioned, there is already one playthrough out there. This is a bit um, compressed playthrough. So I'm thinking to do that my own style at a later point in time, really with full explanation of what I'm doing and so on. But right now, I think this is sufficient to give you a little overview about the rules of the game and together with a playthrough from Michael, I think you should be pretty good. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope to see you soon in one of my next videos. Right now I'm not so sure what I will be doing, so there might be a little video coming up which would give you the opportunity to yeah, say your wishes, what you would like to see. And until then, hope to see you soon and bye bye!